Amen. Now, as you take your Bible and turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we'll read there in just a little bit. I said on Sunday I want to talk to you about the worst little sinner in the church. And I'm going to identify the worst little sinner in the church here in just a second or two. But I'll tell you how bad this is. It has driven people away from church. It has broken up homes and families. It has crushed people's hearts. It has destroyed relationships. Who is this worst sinner in church? Well, look at verse 6, Acts 3 and verse 6. And you'll find the answer. Acts 3 and verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, among our members in the church, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. That's pretty strong language. Pretty strong language. I want us to look at what the Word of God has to say about the tongue. We won't see all of it. We're going to see what it says in James here and one or two other references, but there's much more throughout the Scripture. Right now, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Give us an understanding, we pray. Guide us by your Spirit into all truth. And forgive us those things which would cause us to be distracted tonight. Forgive us those things which would cause your work to be hindered in us. We do pray that you'd be with the young people's meeting in the other building. And Lord, we pray if there's a soul listening tonight who does not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, that tonight you would bless and help them. Now, Father, we commit this time to you, trusting in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words can be a blessing. Our words can also be a curse. Our words can build people up. Our words can tear people down. Blaise Pascal was a French philosopher and writer and, uh, and many wise things that he has said, but he said this, quote, kind words do not cost much, yet they accomplish much. They also produce their own image on men's souls, and it is a beautiful image. Let me run that by you again. That's the end of the quote. Blaise Pascal, kind words do not cost much, yet they accomplish much. They also produce their own image on men's souls, and it is a beautiful image. Nathaniel Hawthorne, early writer, American writer, uh, going back to the early days of the country, wrote this, quote, words so innocent and powerless as they are standing in a dictionary, how potent for good and evil they become in the hands of one who knows how to combine them. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who is known as one of the early American poets. He wrote, a torn jacket is soon mended, but hard words bruise the heart of a child. And from an unknown source, be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. So James is talking to us about the tongue, beginning at verse 2. We looked last Wednesday night at verse 1. Uh, my brother, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. But in verse 2, he says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. What does that mean? It means if you can control your tongue, if you can control what you say, you'd pretty much be a perfect Christian. Many things we offend all. There's many ways in which we offend people. Uh, I speak for myself, but I've often offended people when I, I didn't intend to offend them. It wasn't my, my desire, my intention. I had no ill will towards them at all, but nonetheless offended them. And that's sad, but true. But in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, not with your mouth, you don't offend in word, 
The same is a perfect man. And the word perfect there means perfect. The same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So the point James is making here is if you can control your tongue, you can control any part of your body. Now, I've often said the strongest, two strongest urges that any human being has. Number one, your strongest urge you have is the urge to breathe. No doubt about it. Uh, you don't think so, get where you can't breathe for a while and you'll find out real quick. That is the strongest urge you have is the urge to breathe. And you have to breathe for life. The second strongest urge that people have is the urge to eat. That's also necessary for life. It's not as strong an urge as breathing. You can live a lot longer without eating than you can without breathing. Well, you can't live as long without drinking as you can without eating. Well, that that's true, but it goes kind of hand in hand. When I was a kid, and I don't even know where I heard this or who taught it to me, but somebody had me believing that you could live three days without water and seven days without food. Folks, that's not true. That is not true. You can live longer than three days without water. You can live longer than seven days without food. You can, unless you have other health complications. But sooner or later, you're going to have to have some water, and sooner or later, you're going to have to have some food. And if you can control the urge to eat, you can you can control a lot of things in your life. You have pretty good self-control, but if you can control what you say, James says you're pretty much a perfect person. You're able to control the whole body if you can just control what you say. Look at verse 3. He says, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, I did a little research on this, and the bit when James wrote this was pretty much just a rope that went around the horse's mouth. But here it says the bit's in the horse's mouth. And when we're talking about a bit now, and years ago they would use wood. I suppose some people maybe still use wood, but usually it's a metal piece. It's usually no longer than that, about the width of the horse's mouth. And it's about that thick. And you put it in there, and the reins are attached to it, and you pull on that and it turns the horse's head in whichever way you pull it. That's the way the trained horse will go. What do you mean, a trained horse? Well, a horse that's not trained, you go yank it on their mouth, they may buck you off. <laughs> okay? So that's what I mean by a trained horse. Uh, they're, they're not, horses in general are not stupid animals. I say in general because I'm sure there are exceptions to that. So they have a brain and they think and they respond to how you treat them. And if you're gonna treat them rough, they can show you that they can be rougher than you can. And you know what, they can. Now look at James' point here. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Think about that. The average horse, depending on the breed, weighs anywhere, adult horse, of course, um, the average horse, depending on the breed, weighs between 800 and 2,200 pounds, somewhere in between there. Not all horses are the same size and different breeds and so forth, but anywhere from 800 to 2,200 pounds. And yet you can take that little bit and turn that horse and get it to go where you want it to go. And that's what James is saying here. That's exactly what he's saying here. So. <clears throat> The bit turns the great animals wherever the rider leads, and they follow. They follow. Verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be great, and are driven of fierce winds. In those days, most ships were driven by wind. I say most, not all. Well, you mean some of them had engines on them? Not that I know of. But the Roman ships, the Roman warships were, they had sails, but they were largely uh, powered by oars. And they would have men with oars that stuck out the, the sides of the ship and they would row in sync with each other. And they'd have somebody there beating a drum telling them every time to row. And the, the truth of the matter is uh, those men 
were slaves. And they didn't have a choice about whether they wanted to be there or not. They didn't just sign up for the Navy. They were forced there, and uh, they powered the ships. So if there was wind, yes, they would use the wind. If they didn't have wind to go where they wanted to go, they used the men. And probably more often than not, they used the men. And the faster the man with the drum would beat the drum, the faster they would have to row. But they had to row in sync with the beat of the drum. And there would always be somebody standing next to the drummer with a long whip in case somebody got a little slack in what they were doing. So the truth of the matter is, that's why I said most ships were driven by wind, and that's what James is talking about here. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, large, large ships. Um, I was again doing some research, and the word ships here, so one commentator said could be translated as a boat. That doesn't fit what it says here. Behold also ships, which though they be great, this is not a little boat, this is a large ship and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. That doesn't mean like the governor of the state, like we think of today, it means the governor of the ship or the, the captain of the ship or whoever's standing at the helm. And the helm here means a paddle-shaped object. And you think about the rudder on a ship and that's what it is, it's a paddle-shaped object. I've never stood at the controls of a large ship. I have been in many small boats and have driven power boats, but I've rowed a lot of canoes and, and row boats and things like that. And I'm gonna tell you, you can turn it with your paddle. And if you know how to use it, you put the paddle and you can make it go left or right. And uh, because as you move the paddle, largely acting like a fishtail, as you turn it, it causes the water to flow at a greater rate of speed on one side or the other, and that will cause pressure on that one side of the ship or the boat and will cause it to move in one direction or another. Now, in James' day, that was probably in a smaller boat, it would be a uh, handle on the rudder that you could move from inside the boat. But in larger ships and later ships, they have a wheel, and it was on a system of ropes and pulleys. Did they have ropes and pulleys in the New Testament times? They certainly did. They'd be on a system of ropes and pulleys and they could guide the ship that way. You know what they have today? These great big cargo ships, these great big cruise ships and all that. You know what they have? They have a little stick. A little stick not much bigger than my finger there. And they, they move the ship with that. Why, it's all computer driven. <laughs> and they just move a little stick like you'd play a computer game on the screen with, and I steer the ship with that. The point is, it's a small thing that moves the big ship. It's a small thing that moves the big horse. It's a small thing that moves the big ship. And verse five, even so, the tongue is a little member, long way from being the biggest part of your body. Your hands are much bigger, your feet are much bigger, many parts of your body are much bigger than the tongue. But he says, even so, the tongue is a little member which boasteth great things. And does it not ever boast great things? You know, folks, we're in election time. Politicians are always telling you about what they're going to do. Oh, if you vote for me, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make big things happen. They always talk about it. Many times after, I won't say every time, because that's not true, but many times after they get elected, they don't do any things they said they were going to do. Now, I've known some who did, and I respect the ones who do what they promise to do. Well, preacher, don't you understand once you get elected, you don't just have free reign to do anything you want. I, I do know that. And sometimes they get opposition once they're in office and and they get pressure from different sides and things and they can't accomplish everything they, they thought they would. That's also true, it's very true. But the fact of the matter is, I've seen some politicians who got elected and kept their promises. And I respect that, and I, I've said that twice now, I'm gonna say it again, because even those who promise to do things that, that cause me not to vote for them, 
I respect the fact that when they got in their office, they did what they promised to do. At least they kept their word. Now, again, I didn't necessarily like what they did, but they kept their word. Or maybe I wasn't opposed to what they did, but the manner in which they did it is something I would disagree with. But nonetheless, they kept their word. They did what they promised to do. And I, I have to respect people who keep their word. But in verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Here in, in Florida and out in California and in some of the other western states, and it happens other places too, it happened uh, last year, I think, 23, I think, in, in California. I, I meant to say Hawaii. It happened in California too, but I meant to say Hawaii. They had great wildfires. And they burn acres and acres and acres. Do you know those things don't start out as great wildfires? They usually start out with a little fire. Sometimes it's a campfire that somebody didn't get out. Sometimes somebody's working and working with fire and to a good purpose, but it gets out of control. Sometimes it's a, a tossed cigarette. Sometimes, and this is terrible, but it's true, sometimes they are set purposely they mean to set somebody means to set a, a wildfire and, and cause a lot of damage a lot of heartache a lot of loss for people but none of them start out as fires that burn acres and acres and acres they start as a small thing but it grows and grows and grows and that's what he's saying here verse 6 the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity a world of iniquity what is iniquity it's sin it's wickedness it's ill intent. It's purposely doing sin. A world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. Now, I'm going to show that to you in the scripture in a minute here, but, but stay with me. The tongue defiles the whole body. It corrupts. It makes dirty the entire body. And then he says, it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And that's what we were talking about a while ago. A little fire grows into a, a wildfire. And last phrase of verse 6, it is set on fire of hell. Now I read in the scripture about the fires of hell. And Jesus said it's a place where the fire is not quenched, where it never goes out. So many people in our world today say, well, I just don't believe in hell. That's an old myth, myth that people tell. And sometimes preachers use it to try to scare people. I'm not trying to scare anybody into anything. I'm trying to help you know reality and not, not get in trouble. Not get into a situation that lasts forever that you never want to be in. And you can't get out of. set on fire of hell words have won hearts and they've broken hearts words have moved nations to victory but they've also started wars words have destroyed marriages homes businesses careers and institutions that's all in verse 6 verse 7 for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed by of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And he's going to demonstrate that to us in a moment. But James here main, maintains that mankind has tamed pretty much every kind of beast. And I've seen examples of people handling some of the wildest creatures in the world without coming to harm. I remember somewhere down towards Miami way years ago, and not sure exactly where it was. I, I have an idea, but I don't want to say because it might, I might name the wrong place. We were down there watching a, a bird show, and the fellow was handling birds, and um, he had, uh, I think it was a crow, fly out over the audience and, and pick something up and bring it back to him. And then he had a, a smaller bird, I believe it was a cockatiel, I'm not sure, but I think that's right. And um, 
was one of the funniest things I think I ever saw. He had the little bird, little white bird on his finger like this, and on a signal, the little bird turned and put his beak on his on his shoulder like this and made it sound like he was blowing his nose. <laughs> it's just one of the funniest things I ever saw, is to watch that bird. He wasn't actually blowing his nose, but he made it sound, look and sound like it. And it's great to watch that. Uh, just uh, maybe a year or so ago, uh, my wife and I were with a, our family out. Yeah, it was in 23. We were out in Arizona. And there was a fellow out there who had a, uh, a falcon and uh, got to put on the, uh, the leather arm piece there. There's a name for it. I'm forgetting it right now. Where you can hold it out and that bird would just come and land right there and stay there. Stay there until you launched it off. And then it would go get something and come right back. That was, that was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. I had nothing to do with training that bird to do that. The, the man who owned the bird did. I've seen people train tigers. I've seen people do other things. I personally have, with that hand right there, I, I've been able to pet a live shark. No kidding, no kidding. And of that same hand, I've had stingrays come and eat out of my hand. Now, did I make them do that? No, no. Other people had worked with them and, and made that possible. That's what James is saying here. Big cats and other animals, the big elephants, other animals. Mankind can train animals. He can control them. Verse 7 again, every kind of beast and of birds and serpents and yeah, I've seen people handle snakes too. And you know what? You can have my part of that. And of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. See why I call it the worst little sinner in the church? An unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's beyond a wild beast. When James says it's an unruly evil, it's no wonder that sometimes the best words are those we don't say. In the book of Proverbs, it says this, a fool uttereth his all. I'm sorry, let me try that again. A fool uttereth all his mind. A wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. What it's saying is you don't always have to say everything you think. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. Abraham Lincoln expressed the same idea, not under inspiration, but same idea where he said, it's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and be, remove all doubt. And the, the fact of the matter is, sometimes the best words are those we do not say. It's an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. How's it full of deadly poison? Hey, did you hear the latest? Do you know what I heard? Somebody told me, hey, did you hear about him? <laughs> you know what she did? Yeah. Full of deadly poison. This is just between you and me. Don't tell anybody else. Do you realize when you say to somebody, don't tell anybody else, you, you do know they're going to, right? Mm -hmm. They are. You know what they're gonna do? They're gonna go to somebody else and say, no, don't tell anybody else. And then that person goes and says to somebody else, don't tell it. This is one of the fastest ways to get something spread around, is tell somebody not to say it. That's how the tongue is full of deadly poison. Or when we speak hurtful words, when we speak condemning words, full of deadly poison. Verse 9, he gives us the example of it. Therewith, with our tongue, we bless God even the Father. And we do. What do we do? We sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Isn't that good? It's good that we do that. But look what he says. Therewith, with the tongue, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. What do you mean made after similitude? Made in the image of God. We bless God and with the same mouth we curse men who are made in the image of God. Can I recommend that we don't curse people? 
I know people can make you awfully angry. A preacher hadn't anybody ever made you angry so many times I couldn't count it. But you have to learn to control what you say. James goes on. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't have blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth. Now, I, I've never seen anybody do it this way, but here's the idea that James is getting across. God bless you and God curse you. I've never heard anybody do it that way, but it, when you are double-tongued like that, you get the um, you get that same effect. In the old Western movies, a lot of times there'd be a scene, and I don't know how many times the same line was was in different movies, but it was. There'd be a Native American speaking, and he'd say, "White man speak with forked tongue." And what does he mean? Like a snake with a forked tongue? Yeah, it means that, but it means it says two different things. Blessing, cursing coming out of the same mouth. That's what that that's what that means. And if you know your history, you know why that they would have said that. But Jesus said this beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, for inwardly they're ravening woods. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them, Matthew 7, 15 to 20. Again, Jesus said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, for, for from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Matthew 12, 36, 37, Jesus said, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I don't know about you, that, that concerns me greatly. Every idle word shall be called into account. I, I'm telling you folks, I've said some things in my lifetime I wish I'd never said. And then when I read, Jesus says, every idle word shall be called into account. Every idle word men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I remember years ago, I was talking to another brother. We went to the same church, and we were talking about a third brother. And you know, you won't believe this, but the third brother we were talking about wasn't there. We were talking about two of us talking about somebody else wasn't there. I know you've never done that, but I'm, I'm telling you, I did it once, maybe more than once. And we were talking about this other brother, and you know what? I got convicted in my heart, and I said to the fellow I was talking to, we've got to stop this. He says, what? We've got to stop talking about this other brother. He says, why? And I quoted him this verse. Every idle word that men shall speak, they'll give account thereof in the day of judgment. I said, someday I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to have to give account for this conversation. I'm going to stop it right now before it gets any worse. You really don't think that way. Yeah, I really do. I really do think that way. That's why Paul wrote to the Colossians, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. James is saying the same mouth that blesses God should not curse men who are created in the image of God. And James ends verse 10 with that phrase my brethren these things ought not so to be let's finish up verses 11 and 12 doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either of vine figs so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh I talked to you a bit ago about the Vincents and how they have water that they can 
wash with and they can flush their toilets with and they can cook with and they can do other things but can't drink it. Too rich in minerals. Can't drink it. And James is saying a fountain must give fresh, sweet water or bitter water. What if a fountain did both? Well, you wouldn't know which would come out. You wouldn't know whether you're going to get fresh water or bitter water out of it. So what are you going to do? You're probably going to abandon it and go find a better source of water. What about people? You never know what's going to come out of their mouth. You never know whether it's going to be something sweet or something bitter. You never know whether it's going to be blessing or cursing. Is that really who you want to have conversation with? Probably not. James says no fountain can give salt and fresh water. They can't do both. Figs don't bear, fig trees don't bear olives. Vines don't bear figs. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 20. Proverbs 15, 1. I said other parts of the Bible talk about this. We don't have time to go there. Proverbs 15, 1 says this. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Think about that. A soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. A lot of times we teach that verse to children, Proverbs 15, 1. And I like to use a little hand motion with it. I like to say a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. And they get it going. When you see that motion, what do you think about? Well, you live here in South Florida, you probably think about a hurricane, right? And that's kind of what grievous words are like. Like stirring up a hurricane. A soft answer turns away wrath. You know, it's it's easier for me to tell you that than it is to do it. It is. Because to do it, you've got to think about what you're going to say before you say it. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand, but I'll raise mine. You ever said anything, and after you said it, you realize that was the wrong thing to say? My hands are up. Yeah. Yeah. And too many times. So we have to choose our words carefully. We must not only think what we have to say, but how those words are going to be heard. It takes time, it takes work, it takes practice, and honestly, it takes prayer. But if we can control our tongue, we will have won one of the greatest victories in life. You're open to James. Look at chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Lord, give us the mind and the spirit and help us by your spirit to control our tongue. Help us to speak words that edify, that build up, that encourage, that strengthen, rather than words that curse. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to think about and pray about what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. Now, Father, bless us as we go to a season of prayer. We ask in Jesus' name.